So, um, so yeah, so it's not, it's not about Java, it's not about um, abstract factory, factory, factories. Um, this is, a, again, pretty simple stuff. So um, it's, a very, it's a very simple pattern. And basically, in backbone apps, what it means is that you pass in your dependencies to your constructor objects, and then you check for them. And you throw errors if they're, in, if they're not present. And essentially, what this allows you to do is enforce the constraints uh, that are built in inherent to your application so that you know later on when you when you rely on these things that are assigned to you as instance properties like this collection in this example that you know they're going to be there you're creating a contract inside your code that's enforced and it will throw errors and you know the benefit here is that whoops, the benefit here is that it's easy to test so um, Thank you for uh, for presenting or for presenting on, on testing earlier. This was uh, something that I was going to have to kind of pause and explain, but uh, this is uh, you know using uh, Jasmine or um, Jasmine or, or Mocha with uh, with Chai. It's very easy to uh, to check that you know if you try to instantiate this class without a um, you try to instantiate this class with, without your uh, whoops. Okay, now we're getting back. Um, if you try to instantiate this with, without your uh, your actual dependency in there, it's going to throw. It's going to error. You can check that readily and easily. And so, um, keep trying to go to that slide. Um, and it's very easy to understand just from looking at, at an initialize method what is required for a, for a given class instance to to work and to function. And so, I'm going to be showing some more code throughout the throughout the rest of this talk. To really show what exactly this means and kind of what the what the benefits are. So um, you're enforcing your application's restraint constraints by contract, and if you're depending on another class, just make it explicit that you're doing so. Throw errors if your dependencies aren't met, and pass dependencies as options into into your constructors. It's essentially making sure that your application knows how it's going to run. And so backbone apps tend to start small. And then they get really, really large and really, really big. Um, and so yeah, so they get nothing enormous. Um, and it can be really frustrating over time when you're working on larger and larger applications that you have classes that you don't know how to use, that you don't have a clear pattern for, for using. And so we're going to be talking about um, some of the ways to organize things a little bit better and uh, you know some of the pitfalls that you can that you can run into. So. The most, my favorite line from the backbone documentation, and what I tell people when I'm working with teams that are, are when I'm consulting with them on backbone apps, is that there's more than one way to do it. And so, if you've done this differently, or if you have different opinions about that, that's great. One of the benefits of backbone is that it's very flexible. And so, just keep that in mind. So, let's take one step back um, before before we move any further. So backbone apps present two distinct types of organizational problems. The first is constructors. So constructors are the literal plans of your application. They are they're created to they're made to create instances and they unless you're assigning static class me methods to them, they're really not that useful on their own until you actually do something with them, until you create an instance. So instances, this is your application when it's running. This is where the state of your application lives sensibly really care about when you're when you're right when you're debugging your app when you're actually putting everything to, together making all these constructors come to life into an application and so how do you go about organizing these two things well there's the global namespace that, that you can use it's very easy to um, to tack things into it creating globals in JavaScript is um, ex almost too easy to do and um, you know then there are module systems that you can use to organize your constructors so, um, so yeah. So I know. Let's use global variables to organize all of the, uh, all of these things. And so that what happens is this. This is a really common pattern that um, that most people have used before. And it's I call it the single namespace blues. Is that you end up creating these kind of ad hoc standards to, uh, and you have kind of a lot of this boilerplate code of checking that you know if this app exists, make sure that all of the kind of internal structure is there before you move on. And, but then you still have this problem where you're creating, you're creating classes and creating naming conventions that don't necessarily have to line up to file names. 
and it, it's it's also it gets confusing it, when eventually you're you go to start your app in this final in this final uh, final snippet you actually go to start your application and it, you also have to attach it to the global namespace so that you can access it through the command line. Can that be made any bigger? Perhaps. <laughs> there we go. Hey. Big enough? <laughs> cool. <laughs> so the problem is, is that this is brittle. Um, relying on the global namespace like this, um, it's brittle. It's like this, uh, this woman trying to get a taco. It's just not working. Um, and so really outside of the Rails asset pipeline, which um, is based on a based on directives that concatenate, that help you concatenate files. Um, this is really hard to do, and, it and it's not very portable when you have to rely on you know, a concatenation script to run to slap all your JavaScript together into one bundle, or you're you know, dumping uh, dozens and dozens of script tags into, uh, into an HTML document to serve your application. Even when that's done pr programmatically, like, like it is in the asset pipeline, it can, be, it, it can be brittle, it can be unruly, and again, this is about ad hoc conventions that you have to that you that you have to put together to figure out how to do this stuff. So globals go against the grain of modularity. Um, Dave Herman put this really well. Um, this is in his book um, uh, Essential JavaScript, um, Effective JavaScript rather. Um, and so the globals also create this kind of this net effect of an intergalactic wormhole in your application. Globals can change at any given time, and relying on their presence either for passing constructors around or passing instances around is problematic. It's uh, it, it's something that's uh, that you know is very easy to do, and in the simple cases like in to do MVC, um, it's it, it's shown as kind of like this only way, the lingua franca of like how you do this, and it really just doesn't apply to building large applications, and so. There's nothing actually like wrong with this. There are just more expressive patterns for doing this. And so I'm gonna talk about modules. Many people have opinions about modules. Backbone takes a stance of um, kind of finger in the ears neutrality towards modules and that it just attaches itself to the global namespace and then lets you do what you want with it but is common JS compatible and you can shim it with required JS. Um, so modules can help organize your constructors. So if a Backbone app is made up of all of these different constructors that you throw together when you create instances, you need a, a means of organizing those and tying that into the file system so that you can you know, use folders to separate these files, use the actual use good naming conventions. It makes it so that it can be very clear when you look at an app that's, that's using either CommonJS or RequireJS to see what an individual module depends on. And so that's one type of dependency in injection that's very important for being able to, to organize apps effectively. And so dependency injection, and this is the, the type of manual dependency injection that, that we saw a little bit of earlier and we'll be seeing more of in a, in a second. Um, dependency injection helps organize the instances of your application. So the actual, your code while it's running, you can actually have these two dependency graphs. One of all the dependencies in your, based on your constructors, what your constructors need to create new objects. And then two, your instances, what your instances will rely on to listen uh, to listen to events and to uh, you know call methods and to have you know models uh, models render views and kind of have all of these uh, you know chained reactions in your application. And so, keeping your module system and instant management separate divides and reduces the cognitive load of your app. So this concept of cognitive load means that you know. Every time you kind of sit down to code, every time you're going to write something in your application, you have to think about what you're doing. You have to open the files. You have to find the you know find the, the relevant class to what you're writing. You have to create new things. And so, the less you have to think about doing that, the more time you can actually spend writing code and you know or you know fixing defects or um, you know creating more features. So, keeping these two systems separate and distinct is really really important. You might be saying, why not just use require? I'm sure Tim Brannion is asking this right now. Why not just use require? And so require is, again, it's completely valid, but the same types of problems come, 
come up when you're using one system to manage these two different types of things. You don't know whether you're passing around your application instance, which is a singleton that you're not supposed to modify, or whether you're passing around a constructor that you that, that's meant to be used with a new keyword. So I've just always thought that using one thing to manage two things ends up being confusing in the long run. So I talked about these two types of dependency graphs. And you know what's actually cool is that there are uh, visualizations that you can come up with to, uh, to really express how these, how these things look when your application's running. And um, the first that we'll, that we'll take a look at um, you know, are the constructors. That, and like I said, this, these are the blueprints of your application. And then what's a little bit harder to, to imagine and what we're <laughs> going to have to use our imaginations for um, is the, the, instance of, the instances of your app, the things that actually compose your app while it's running. And so um, this is, I, it's a hurricane of awesomeness. Um, so this is actually from, a, from an app that, um, that, that we wrote uh, earlier this year. And these are all of the dependencies uh, from require.js. And you can kind of see everything is circling around. The templates are actually, the templates are actually reigning the whole kind of center of the application instance, and then there's a config module that lives <laughs> off on its own. Um, that's just static and exposes a global vari variable. So, you know, this gives you a good idea of, you know, from the from the uh, actual like constructor dependency chains, what you know your app is actually doing, kind of how those relationships can can be expressed. And you know, we actually ran this on a bunch of different apps, and they've actually all end up looking very similar in that we have um, <coughs> you know, several modules that are tightly dependent on one another and then a whole bunch of modules kind of sprouting off from the side, whether they be templates or views or helpers or these kind of one-off methods and again, a uh, config sitting off here. Side. Um, so the, uh, the, the first type of, of these kind of visualizations is really easy to make pro programmatically assuming that you're using modules. If you're just using global variables to dump everything into, um, you're not going to be able to, uh, to really get this easily. Um, I generated those with a, with a cool tool called Dependo. Um, and so that will take a, a common JS or an AMD project and kind of make this really cool D3 visualization. It would have had like the live visualizations in here, but they're kind of crashing the browser. There are too many modules. But, um, but yeah, so so the instance dependency graph is, is a bit more ephemeral. And you, know, you kind of have to run your application to see it. And actually, one of the best ways to really get into what, you know, how your app is run, running when you visualize this is to you know, expose part of your application to the console, to expose a global variable. And then be able to tree into your application, say, you know, app.model, app.collection app.collection.view or whatever your your internal structure is and you know the console is actually a really powerful prototyping tool that you know aside from you know test driven development and uh, you know actually just running things in the in the browser you can get, get really far by just having you know a single global variable exposed that your application that your primary application instance attaches to and then that you can go in and kind of Check that object structure and ensure that you know the expected JSON is uh, is what you want it to what you want it to be at, at a given time. Um, again, this isn't like a complete substitute for like breakpoint debugging, but it's a very very important concept that um, actually can kind of get ignored or missed sometimes. So let's talk about refactoring a little bit. So re refactoring just for a refresher. So altering the structure of your application while keeping the behavior intact. And so oftentimes this is moving or renaming files, this is changing method names, this is you know, kind of moving things into uh, better organi organized patterns. And refactoring without tests is really just changing stuff. So going back into the kind of the, the test-driven development talk from, from earlier, um, it's really, really important to have a baseline of both unit tests and functional integration tests if you're going to take refactoring seriously and not just have it be a series of arbitrary changes that you're making that may or may not break your application and cause you a lot of headache. So this moves into um, some patterns for, for applications. And Jeremy spent a lot of time this morning talking about um, kind of different patterns in, in Backbone. And 
you know, this is going to be uh, touching on this, a, touching on some of these a, a little bit, a, a little bit more, and you know, kind of throwing in some opinion and some experience, ex experience-based opinions in there. So um, we'll be talking about application views, um, the single point of entry to access instances, which I talked about, you know, exposing your application to the to the global namespace and being able to to go in and explore that, you know, the object tree of instances that you, that you've created, and talking a little bit about having views that are long lived, and this is something that, um, you know, you can, you know, Jeremy made a very good point earlier today. Um, talking about you know applications that are meant to be running for a very very long time you know that you can kind of leave your browser session open for weeks and come back to it at, at any given point and you know I feel like a lot of there's a lot of you know kind of hair pulling that happens when you know you try to are too aggressive with uh, with tearing applicate with tearing things down and you know there are some cases where you can just have long-lived views that are really just hidden and that you come back to really depends on the nature of your application. And so like, you know, I see the kind of, you know, re I see, you know, kind of chasing down those garbage collection wins of, you know, tearing down big sections of your application as an optimization step. And it's something that, you know, you really don't need to start with the assumption that every view that you create is going to eventually call destroy. You're, you can very well do that and uh, listen to and stop listening makes that a lot easier, but you're gonna have a much easier life if you you know, treat some of the larger sections of your application as things that will be long-lived. So um, I'll, I'll zoom in here again. Okay. So this is a pattern. Um, this is you know code that I that I pulled from from an application that is showing you know just a small snippet of what you can do with you know some of this basic dependency injection. And we'll talk about you know patterns for enforcing this in a little later on. And so this is a this is a view that attaches itself to the body, and it fires up a collection. This is assuming again that you know uh, media collection and user model are both things that you know it, these constructors were accessing by way of uh, of require JS or common JS. Um, so. You know, this is pretty. This is pretty standard. But what's happening here when we're looking at the when we're looking at where, where we create this injector object and we put a reference a reference to this actual class um, just by saying you know injector .app is this and a reference to this collection and then that actually gets shared and inherited through all of these different views and what and a router and so what these individual views are going to do is actually apply that pattern we saw earlier of within the within the actual initialize method they'll expect that a collection is going to be created and they'll throw if it's not there they'll they'll expect to be passed an application instance because perhaps they're using that application instance as their applications event bus you know instead of using the global backbone events or instead of um, in, 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 instead of you know relying on some other system or you know directly calling methods on these other on these other classes that they might be that they might have a reference to, using that application the application view itself as their you know kind of main as that central hub inside the, these dependencies of, of objects, and so and then in, you know finally we'll um, we'll actually attach this attach this to the window and call uh, call history start and then you know assuming that our router is going to take over from there and you know start calling methods either directly on the application or trigger or trigger an event for some of these views to do something. So the instances have a reference to the application view if they need it. There's nothing saying that you know we have to pass that to them, but this was from an application where it was a pretty small surface area and all these views needed to reference this this main application view. The application view is doing other stuff later on in the file. So this is normally almost always an instance property. So again, you know, if we tree into that from the from the console in our browser, and most browsers have even IE has a has a serviceable console. Um, so there's no excuse for <laughs> for not doing this or for not at least being able to look at your application while it's running. And um, so they're referenced by by properties on the instance that we'll attach directly. And again, we'll look at some patterns for doing this in a moment. Um, and the circular references here are totally fine. Um, 
they J JavaScript optimizes optimizes for this, and um, we can just leave this slide up for the next uh, 22 minutes. If you want. Um, so JavaScript opti optimizes for this. And Ron Swanson mustache hair is really it's just something about that gift. Um, so so the app instance gets pushed down to every object that depends on it, as well as that is that collection that collection instance. So this is a great pattern for you know showing really how you can share a collection or share a model between multiple different views. And in essence, this is dependency in injection. But what makes it different than just you know passing these things around is having a, a clear pattern to enforce it. So there's some simple sugar, and again, there are a million ways of doing this. Um, this is just one. But we can you know create a little enforced dependency <coughs> fixin wherein we take a we take a given a, a given model or view or collection a class with a k and we filter its dependencies and we make sure that we make sure that the dependencies are there in, in the options hash hash that will forward to this and we'll throw an error if they're not there and then the second part of the filter is um, making sure that they're not already present on the on the class so like model and collection and several other magic properties get get mixed in. I can never keep track of what they are between between classes. So just uh, just having something that checks to make sure that they're there. And then um, this is actually one of my favorite lines from the Backbone source. Um, and this is how Backbone actually mixes in its uh, constructor, it, the options that you pass to a constructor. Um, I think this is a Brad Dunbar line. Um, and when I first saw this, it was like Tim and Eric mind explosion. Um, Kind of really turned my head on on its side, but uh, you pick things out of the option out of the options hash. You pick this array of dependencies out and then extend it back into the class. Um, pretty cool if you have never done that before, never seen that. And then so you know the way to actually apply this. Zoom in here a little bit more. The way to actually apply this is in an initialize method um, to just call it enforce dependencies and pass. Um, pass the reference to the class itself and the options hash that it gets as well as the dependencies that it would actually ha have. And so you could foresee being able to actually mix this in to happen on every constructor to look for these dependencies perhaps as an array of expected dependencies that are a, that are a, a property directly on the prototype. And there are a lot of, a lot of different ways to slice this, but what it breaks down to is that you have a means of enforcing what your instances require, and your application won't work if you use these improperly. Which, if you've worked on a team with any number of, of developers, um, you know, documentation is uh, seems difficult to write, and uh, there's kind of institutional knowledge that uh, people will miss. And you know, having a class that clearly throws an error when you're misusing it, <coughs> it keeps you it keeps you honest, and and it also provides a really easy path for testing these things. So tests are what enforce the contract of dependencies. And without tests for this, um, yeah, you'll see errors in the console. But you know those errors are really meant for developers to write a test against to make sure that this class, this class's behavior is going to do exactly what you what you want it to. And I would rather have an application that only tests its dependencies exist and that each constructor can properly create the instance that you expect it to, then an app that retests methods from backbone underscore and jQuery endlessly, you know, kind of the the heavier side of functional testing that can make its way into unit tests when you're, you know, checking that uh, dollar dot HTML still works. It does. It won't change. Um, and so again, we'll take we'll take a a, a, clo a little bit closer look at this at the same test and. So assert.throws is, is something that comes with chai. I think most every assertion library comes with some ability to check that a check if a function throws an error. So again, we'll just describe playlist view and we'll say it should error if it's created without, without a collection. And in the same way that you can create a, a, a helper or a mix-in for, you know, for attaching these dependencies, you can create loops in your test suite and make sure that if, especially if you're exposing the what the what the named dependencies would be as a property on the prototype, you'd be able to test these things very easily and have a test suite that has actually you know describes your app pretty well. And so the this part is just a regular expression that runs against the uh, the message coming out of the um, coming out of the error that was thrown. 
So um, please, please, please use Sinon JS for spies and stubs. Um, even if you're using Jasmine, it's probably a good idea. The spies that come in Jasmine, um, are, they're they're serviceable, but uh, Sinon offers uh, offers a lot more, in my opinion. And seriously, just just use it, look at it. Um, I'm probably not going to be the last person that mentions it uh, today or tomorrow. So yeah, I th uh, we've talked about this a little bit al already, but apps should be accessible to the outside world from the from the console and really shouldn't underestimate it as a, proto as a prototyping tool. Um, how frustrating is it if you have to use breakpoint debugging and uh, you know, go in and inspect your code just to see you know, one little change or see you know, what, the, what the given value of, of something is. I, for all the time that I spend uh, developing backbone applications, much of that is spent in the console. And um, it's something, just use it and expose your app to the outside world. Give it one place to live. Don't spray a whole bunch of global variables because that's also kind of defeating the purpose. But um, having a means of crawling back into your application after you've, after you've kick-started it is extremely important. And again, even IE has a somewhat useful concept. Um, so the last thing that, um, that this kind of ties into are the solid design principles. And um, they've already been mentioned today. And um, you know, I'm going to mention them again, because I think that you know, a lot of these things are, um, you know, like Jeremy said, you know, OOP 101, but they're not necessarily JavaScript 101. And so you know, JavaScript, if you're starting, like many of us, with a background uh, using jQuery to, uh, or a prototype to enhance you know, HTML documents, um, these things aren't necessarily obvious, and I think that um, one of the most interesting things about Backbone is that it can really unlock the kind of next step in uh, in writing applications and writing well-structured applications. And so the solid design principles, um, it, the Wikipedia page covers it quite well, um, and we'll kind of get a walking tour of, of what they uh, of what they are. But um, if you only write code following these five rules, solid is an acronym. Um, if you only write code following these five rules, you'll uh, you'll actually write apps that are that are pretty clear and reasonably and can be reasonably well understood. Um, and these are the building blocks of object-oriented design patterns. So whenever you know, again, if you learn these and you know you hear Adi Asmani talking about the mediator pattern, you'll kind of understand that it's just a combination of, of these couple things, and that you know. Um, all the kind of design patterns, lingo that gets tossed around is really just a couple of simple con concepts, you know, shaken up and mixed up in different ways. So, um, so just going through uh, top to bottom. Uh, so, the single responsibility principle dictates that a class should only have a single responsibility, and that can get extended to backbone applications and saying that uh, method should only be responsible for one thing, and as soon as it's responsible for two things, you should split that up and create an interface that an interface to that. It helps with unit testing and it just makes your code more sane. Anytime that you have you know, a single method, even if it's like an initialized method that's meant to do a lot, if it's a yard long and takes you know, two you know, vertical monitors to see everything, there's probably an opportunity to refactor that. There's probably an opportunity to, uh, to write tests around that and actually break this up in a way that's structured and organized. So the open closed principle. Software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Um, this is essentially what tells you that you sh shouldn't go around monkeying with uh, with uh, with uh, browser natives, and um, you know that just kind of overwriting prototypes in a way that uh, isn't forward thinking is is a bad thing. Um, Backbone provides a very easy mechanism called extend to do this. It's used just about everywhere, and um, you know, you should definitely, uh, if you do have a need of customization, you should definitely be extending it rather than just, you know, tacking stuff on to backbone model that prototype. So Liskov substitution. Uh, this one's a little bit, uh, a, a little bit more more heady. Um, but objects in a program should be replaceable with instances of their subtypes without altering the correctness of that program. So essentially, it means that. You shouldn't be changing things so much that the that your extensions look no, nothing like their parents. So you know, many times in tests, even with you know enforcing dependency injection, you can get away with you know if something expects a model, it's not necessarily expecting 
the model that it's passed, but perhaps a generic model. So if you're thinking about, you know, well, I need to mock this given state, but it's really just a collection and it's really just, you know, has the, you know, it's using fetch and it's using, you know, event listener methods, you can pass a generic collection around. And Backbone is actually, um, with its extend method, gives you a built-in way of, of doing this pretty easily. Obviously, this one's probably the easiest to break because as soon as you start writing custom methods on your on your models or collections, you can, um, and then using them in other classes, you can get into, into trouble with this. But um, if you kind of follow these other steps, Liskov sub substitutions happens pretty readily. So interface se segregation, um, I touched on this a little bit with single responsibility, but um, again, many client-specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. So even if you are creating one, gen one general purpose interface that's branching out and calling a bunch of, you know, a bunch of individual methods, it's something that your code will always be better if you just make your functions responsible for less and um, separating and separating those, uh, those interfaces up into logical groupings is going to give you a lot of net benefit. And, uh, and finally, dependency inversion. And this is really what ties, ties this all back into dependency injection. And this is that one should depend on abstractions, do not depend, do not depend on concretions. So basically that means that there's this thing that you can do where you flip over your, your dependencies and instead of you know, relying on a bunch of external APIs, rely on the, you know, on the events that those, that those APIs generate. This is something that's you know, kind of built into the heart of Backbone with the, with the, event, with the event system that, that's there in, in everything. So you don't have to you know, rely on polling a model to see its changes, you can listen to, you can listen to change events. And similarly, you can, with, depend, with dependency injection, you can, de you can inject in different versions of, where you can inject in different instances to your, you know, to your views or to your models and listen to, listen to events on them. And that's something that's, you know, can be done generically and, you know, especially with listen to without much, without much overhead or without, you know, permanent damage being done because there's a way of backing, of backing out of that, of moving away from it. And um, so this is uh, John John K. Paul's talk tomorrow um, is uh, is actually touches on touches on this a little bit. So um, you know definitely uh, there's some <coughs> really cool stuff that you can do with uh, jQuery plugins and um, and kind of external APIs in general, especially in the context of Backbone that gives you these kind of rich tools to make uh, interfaces that are uh, easy to follow and well designed. So um, again. Talking about modules a little bit, uh, Dominic uh, Danicola has uh, talked ES6 is nigh. Uh, the link is here. It's definitely worth checking out. Modules are coming. They're imminent. And someday, we'll actually get to use them natively without having to uh, transpile into AMD or CommonJS or UMD or whatever the new flavor is going to be in six months. But um, modules, are, modules are really cool, and you should definitely use them. Um, they've picked up some steam. They really make applications easier to write. They, the vote is out of whether they made libraries easier to maintain. Uh, depends on the size for something like Backbone, where it comfortably fits into, into one file. Um, there's, not, there's probably not much, not much to be gained by breaking that up you know, to the ends of the earth. But certainly your applications, when you have tens of thousands of lines of code, you should be using a module system, please. I implore you. Fight for this with your management. Make sure that you know you have the time and the and you know all the resources that you need to refactor into using some type of module system. I think that it's extremely important. And again, not having to not having to think about managing your constructors leaves more time for writing your app and writing tests for your app too. And so, um, just about uh, just about wrapping up. But uh, but a brief aside starts with a, with a bold statement. Um, components are the future, and I think that you know web components. Uh, Tim Brayman is going to be talking a little bit about this tomorrow. Um, web components are something that represent really interesting patterns for you know how we can parse up our applications and how we can focus on writing things that are truly modular. And modular applications, I think, have the best chance at being future proof. Um, Aura JS uh, is an Adi Osmani project. Um, it's Really, it offers a really cool, interesting solution for this. Um, so, Aura components are 
written in JavaScript, so they're ready to use now. You don't have to use polyfills, or you don't have to grok everything that Angular is doing to, uh, to to use these. Um, it's framework neutral, so they actually you know have examples of uh, Aura components working with Backbone, of working with Ember, of working with Angular, um, and they don't make you lock your mo logic in the markup. Um, so it's definitely just kind of food for thought, uh, something to something to, to check out if you're interested in you know kind of looking at something that helps you write code that's modular. Twitter has something similar called Flight, but um, Aura is kind of a little bit more forward thinking. And so a bonus, um, this happens to me all the time. Initialize will never work if it's spelled wrong. Um, I don't know if there's anything we could like, Jeremy, if we could do in the library to like fix this. But um, yeah, initialize won't work if you spell it like that, or the many permutations that uh, I often fat finger. Um, so uh, I'm writing a book called uh, Backbone JS in Action for uh, Manning Publications. Um, it's uh, it's in Meeps right now, so that means you can uh, take a look at the first four chapters and uh, give me feedback in the forums for what you like, what you hate, what you want to see. Um, there is a 45% off coupon, the very, very easy to remember, MLBBJSCO. Okay? Um, I, I don't know why the codes are so obtuse, but, um, uh, but yeah, so so please check that out, and I definitely am trying to make it you know, a good re another good resource in the uh, cavalcade of uh, backbone of things to learn backbone. Um, so, questions? <laughs> Other than questions about this slide? <laughs> Any? Oh. You made uh, reference to exposing your application to uh, the window, essentially attaching it to the window. Are there any benefits to that other than you get to access it from the console? So I think that's that's definitely that's definitely the the primary benefit. I mean, there's yeah, that's a that's a good question. So probably so probably not if you're um, unless you're you know kind of writing a backbone application that you know exposes a plugin of, a, of some of some sort um, you know it's really primarily the means for debugging and kind of being easier easier to get at without having to uh, well there's not really any other way to get at it if you're not exposing it from the window from another context hey Sam you um uh, I really like the part about um, you know checking your dependencies, you know, adhering to a contract there. But uh, a check for existence seems like an awfully weak contract. Uh, I mean, do you have any thoughts on feature detection or you know just inspecting or further tests of those those dependencies you're injecting? Yeah, so you can definitely you can definitely go much further much further down that road and you know check for the check for the individual methods that you're going to use or check that the that the properties that are, are there you know in these in the cases that I showed you know it's essentially checking the um, you know checking checking for, for existence but you can easily do instance of and check that you know this thing that you're passing is actually a model this thing that you're passing is actually you know of a certain type um, so so yes there's a, there's definitely a lot more that you can uh, a lot more that you can that you can do Do you have any thoughts on the Angular JS dependency injection, where it actually does some like magic and parses the method signature? Yes, I do think that it's magic. Um, yeah, and you know, Angular's Angular's uh, take on dependency injection is definitely of the more complex variety. Um, you know, I haven't written a ton of applications using Angular. I've really only done the uh, Kind of boilerplate hello worldly type stuff, so probably not the best person to uh, to speak to that. But I do know that it is um, you know kind of one of the concepts that they lead off with in terms of you know being able to like change the argument order in um, in, dir in directives or you know using the the scope keyword they'll detect and you know pass it in wherever you you use it. So I mean that's definitely uh, more complex, and I think that building something like that into a backbone application would probably just take a lot of code to do. 
um, but certainly, uh, certainly in the same vein. Thanks, everybody.